Okay, um, good afternoon or good morning. I'm going to discuss some work which was done in uh, collaboration with uh, two, two collaborations actually. I'd like especially to emphasize that Erez Aguillon is sitting here in the audience. He'll give uh, further uh, details in a short, in a short talk. Um, the outline of the talk, I'm going to discuss uh, an effect that is known for quite a while, and that is that in certain anomalous processes, there is a certain type of uh, bi-scaling, also called strong anomalous diffusion. This is observed in many systems. Um, and this indicates uh, certain properties of uh, rare fluctuations. And the first part of the talk, I'm going to discuss uh, about a very well-known model, a very simple stochastic model called levy walk uh, And I will discuss the uh, large fluctuations in this system. And the tool I'm going to use is the moment generating function. And this gives something that I call, uh, following mathematical literature, infinite densities. Uh, later, I'll very briefly discuss this big jump, uh, single jump approach to this type of fat-tailed systems. And at the end, I'll leave the stochastic theory and go to more uh, microscopical theory to describe atoms in a uh, uh, dissipative optical lattice. So the mind, uh, the mind frame that I have here in mind is, for example, consider this uh, Lorentz billiard. So this is a system of scatterers arranged on a lattice. And importantly, it has in it a so-called infinite horizon, that is, the particles can fl flow in these directions. And the particle here is doing a ballistic motion and colliding with these uh, scatterers. And here you have many collisions, and then it moves in straight lines. And once in a while, it can go and move ballistically. If you look at one trajectory of this type of uh, dynamics, you see uh, regions where the motion looks like diffusive, and maybe you expect from here some diffusive scaling. But you also see once in a while very long trajectories going along one of these infinite horizon axes. And already from here, you can see that what is this type of motion? On the one hand, maybe it's diffusive. On the other hand, maybe it's ballistic. And I'm going to claim here that the rare fluctuations are controlled by these Long trajectories, ballistic, and the typical or bulk fluctuations are diffusive, more or less. And then you have a mixture of these two guys. Importantly, in this system, this is a very close to a levy walk. You have these, it's well known fact that the distribution of these times of these flights is power low tail distributed. And uh, if you look now, uh, these are simulations done by Sergei Denisov. This is the, the distribution of the particles. You all start in one common origin. Velocity is initially to all directions, so there are no drifts. So this is the shape of this propagator. This is the density. At, at the center, you have uh, what I call typical fluctuations, and these will be generally described by some center limit theorem. But then you have these long plumes in these simulations which you have some rare events. And the, the point here is that the center part will be described by diffusive scaling and these rare events by ballistic scaling. Uh, we have a theory for this, which is now in progress, but I'll describe here a character, caricature of this dynamics based on stochastic model. So before going into the model, uh, a well-used uh, uh, method to analyze these type of uh, typical and rare fluctuations is using simply the observed moments of the diffusive process. One defines the absolute value, this is in one dimension, uh, the, the qth moment of the, uh, of the process. And then you look at long times, uh, it's t dependence, and it goes like some q times new q. If you have, for example, Brownian motion, or you get nu q is equal half, and then the process is defined diffusive for all the moments. <clears throat> Monoscaling theories mean that this nu is a constant, but in many systems you have here a nonlinear function, and then it means that there is no simple scaling for the full distribution. Very interesting observation was made by Vulpiani and his company, sorry, uh, already nearly uh, 18 years ago. And that is in some systems, I'll soon specify, but also the uh, infinite horizon lowering gas, you look at the spectrum of exponents and you, two, you see two behaviors. And it's very, very, I'm very happy that it's only two. So you see bilinear behavior. Here you see the low order moments, q less than two. 
And here you see this Q nu Q, it behaves in this example more or less diffusively, the slope here is half. And then you go beyond some critical moment, in this example this critical moment is two, and then you see suddenly a different behavior, and here it's linear in Q, and that means ballistic scaling. So here you see some opportunity in the sense that low order moments which capture the center part of the propagator, they are described more or less diffusively, and then high order moments more or less ballistically in this example. This is important for us because what I'm going to say, uh, these moments down here are more or less described by central limit theorems, but these guys up here will be described by a different distribution, which is an infinite distribution, which is not normalized. That will be the message. So this type of uh, bilinear bi scaling, uh, one behavior for s beyond some uh, QC, you see in the previous example was roughly two, and then a different behavior above QC was found in many models, starting with the work of Volpiani, for example, the, the infinite horizon Lorentz gas, and it is also fine for diffusion of particles in the cell uh, that are doing super diffusion, uh, and uh, there, there's a, lo a lot of literature on, on that. So now we want to characterize better the far tails of these distributions and I'm going to do this with a simple stochastic model. So in this model, this, it's a very famous stochastic model called the Levy walk You have pairs of independent identically random variables. One of them is the flight time, and one of them is the velocity of the particle in the flight. Uh, two distributions describe these uh, two random variables, which are mutually independent. One of them is the waiting time distribution, or the flight time, and one is the velocity distribution. Now, the measurement time is simply given by a sum of these waiting times and the last time between the last collision and the measurement time T star. And here you have N, N itself is random depending on these renewal seconds. And then the position of the particle here in one dimension is a sum of displacements, the last displacement between the last interval and the measurement time. And the displacements are simply given by high school velocity times tau. That's it. In usual uh, processes, these last events are not important, but here they're going to be very important to describe the rare events. Now, the focus of the talk is that this velocity distribution has a zero mean, it, it's symmetric, and the, let's say the variance is finite, like in the Lorentz gas, and the waiting time the PDF is a fat tailed, and here I'm going to concentrate only on one case. Alpha is between one and two. This means that the mean value of the time between collisions is finite, but the variance of the time between collisions is infinite. The Lorentz gas is, a, a tau, is alpha equal two, actually, and then you have all kinds of logarithmic corrections, all kinds of bad things. I'm not going to discuss this, but it's close. But again, there are many examples of this behavior. So the trajectory is very simple. You have a velocity, you draw a random variable from this fat tail, and you have this trajectory, and I'm looking at the distribution of x, and it's a renewal process. So the central limit theorem's argument is very uh, easy. Uh, let's say that the number of jumps is the measurement time over the time between collisions, and this is law of large numbers, and let's replace this n by this estimation. Then the position of the particles is the sum of these random variables. Let's assume these are IID random variables. What are these random variables? Again, these are the velocities times t, the time between collisions. And here you have a sum of independent random variables that you apply this Levy central limit theorem. So this guy is going to be a symmetric Levy distributed random variable that will describe the center. Immediately you notice there is a, li a little problem with Levy central limit theorem from a physical point of view because that would predict a fat tail distribution and the mean square displacement, x squared, if you naively believe this, will be infinity. But you know that the velocity has to cut this off and that means already that in the tail you have something else beyond this Levy and that's what I want to discuss. So Levy central limit theorem and Levy flights are considered many times not physical. So what is the plan? We obtain exact expression for these moments. This is uh, done by some method uh, using a, an equation called Montrol-Weiss equation. It's a famous equation that uses the fact that uh, you can use convolution theorem in Laplace and Fourier space with these two psi and f of v. 
and then we differentiate in k, and then we get all the moments in the limit of long time. Then we define the moment generating function. This is one of the tools we use, and this is a, it looks very simple, the usual definition. PK of t, the k is Fourier variable, is one, this is normalization, and then you sum n equal one to infinity, i k to the power n, the moment x n averaged divided by n factorial. This by definition, uh, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to put here the asymptotic value of the moments, and this is important. So I, I put here not the exact values of the moments, but the asymptotic ones. Then I'm going to sum this infinite series, and then I'm going to take the Fourier transform to go back to the position space. Now what I expected, and maybe now I think it's naive, but I, this is what I thought, if I, I, I'll do this exercise, I'll get back the density of particles in the large time because uh, these are the exact moments, but this is very naive and it's not true. So let us just do it for a two-state model. This is just the uh, distribution where the velocity is either plus one or minus one. And then I calculate these moments. It's given by this nice formula. There's a prefactor here. Uh, it, it, the, 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 it's anomalous diffusion as well known. So I can calculate all these moments. Then I can sum this Fourier series. I sum it up, I get some function in K space. And then I do the inverse Fourier transform. I'm not going into the details, but you can find them in my works. And then I get this uh, result. I call this PA, A for asymptotic X of T. I, I follow this procedure. And I find here two interesting results. One of them is that the scaling is x over t. And that is ballistic scaling, because actually I'm looking here at the tails. It's very different than the Levy scale that will describe the center. The other thing is that this uh, thing, this density, I call it the density, is not normalized, because x over t, 1 minus alpha, it's non-integrable close to the origin. So if I integrate here over x, I get infinity. That's why this is called, in mathematical literature, an infinite density. It's not a probability density. I can make a sanity check. If I take this guy, and let's say I want to calculate the moments, the fourth moment, for example, I can multiply this by x to the power four and then integrate. If I do that, I get back the moments. This is a kind of expected. I started with the moments, I just get back the moments. So even though this is not a normalized density, it gives you back the correct values for all the moments that you want to calculate, not only the integer one. And in that sense, it is a density. So, but still you might say, okay, you have something not normalized. What does it mean, uh, let's say, in a simulation? So, okay, what you do is, uh, the, uh, you, you simulate, uh, this is one of the models we looked, and we, you see here in the, uh, uh, the prefactor we have here one over t to the alpha, so I take this to the other side, uh, t to the alpha times the density, and this is the scale variable, x over t, this is the ballistic scaling at the end, and this is the theory, this black line, and it has this power law, so it's non-integrable close to this origin, and then when you simulate for different times, starting with time here, t to the fifth, then as time goes by, the simulation will converge to this master curve, and this is blowing up of the center. So now it's also easy to understand why the area underneath this curve is infinite, because I multiply by t to the alpha. This guy is normalized, but time t to the alpha, so you have an infinite area underneath here, and that's why this scaling function here is not a normalized density, it's an infinite density. So the idea here is that for these systems, you have an infinite covariant density, covariant because it's x over t, and then if I multiply the density by t to the alpha, take this limit to be finite, I find some non-normalized density. Uh, this is the example of the two-state model. And then you need to distinguish between observables. There are types of observables that are integrable with respect to this non-normalized function. For example, the second moment, v squared, v bar is simply the x over t, which is the time average of the velocity, actually. So if I take v squared and I multiply by this function, it is integrable, and then I can calculate this second moment. And then, for example, the normalization is non-integrable, then you cannot use this formula. And what is happening here is the following. You know the Levy density is describing the, the tail. It gives you the moments, the low order moments, but not the second, for example. This, is a, this object is exactly the opposite. It gives you all the high order moments, but not the low ones. 
So this is complementary to the central limit theorem in some sense. And to see this better, uh, let us discuss briefly the central limit. So the Levy central limit theorem uh, says the following, that if I look at the center part of this packet, I'll have a fractional uh, diffusion equation with this exponent alpha. And then I have this diffusion constant, k alpha. So this alpha enters also in the divergence of this infinite density, and it's very easy to understand because the Levy tail has a fat tail, and then this matches this infinite density at the origin, and it's the same divergence. So, uh, uh, and the observables with value Q less than alpha are integrable with respect to the Levy density, but not higher. So if, for example, I look at uh, these moments, uh, these, uh, uh, th 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 this model, it, it gives you this uh, strong anomalous diffusion. Uh, according to Vulpiani, you have one scaling of low order moments, Q over alpha, and then you have this amplitude here, and then be below, above alpha, Again, alpha is the parameter I put in the theory. You have here two, uh, this uh, ballistic type of scaling of the moments. So, so this is bilinear uh, scaling according to Volpiani, the usual stuff. And then you have these two amplitudes. This guy, which is given here, is calculated based on the Levy central limit theorem. And above this critical value, I calculate this guy, this is calculated by the infinite density. And of course, there is a critical moment, Q equal alpha, where things are complicated and they belong to both of them. And so this, this part of the world is Levy and this part of it is the ICD. What is the general formula we found is the relation between the ICT and the velocity distribution. I can find it in a, a general uh, setting. Any velocity distribution, uh, let's say symmetric, is given by this formula where given this thing, I, this velocity distribution, I can calculate the rare fluctuation. It means that the velocity distribution in this process will influence the tail. But this is still kind of universal in the sense that from the waiting time point of view, only alpha is essentially important here. So you have some sensitivity of what is the velocity distribution. And because you can match this uh, solution with the central part, with the Levy part, I can look at many different models, the velocity model with two-state, velocity model with Gaussian distribution, or velocities or exponential distributions, and because they match all of them, the, the fat tail of the Levy, I can multiply this infinite density by the diffusion constant, and all of them will fall on the same line. And here you see the rare fluctuations because I'm scaling this x with t, and you see what you expect, for example, here, this one is the Gaussian. The Gaussian velocity has a bit wider tail compared to the exponential, and the two-state is cut off abruptly here, etc. So you see the phenomenology you expect. There is a principle or some idea of, this is work with Alessandro Vezani and Raffaella Borioni. We didn't publish it yet, that in these uh, uh, systems, this was mentioned also briefly in the previous talk, there is one event in the sequence that controls the rare fluctuations. And this you can see already from a, a sum of independent identically random variables. So if you look at, let's say, positive identically distributed random variables, you ask what is the probability that they are bigger than capital X? This is proportional, the same thing as the maximum of all these guys. So there's one big guy in the jump process that controls uh, the events. This is true for IIDs. I'm not sure about the Levy walk, which is not IIDs, but you can hand wavingly get the same result that I was just discussing in the following way. Let us assume probability of your particle being at x, some position x greater than x is some effective number of attempts to jump times the probability of jumping in a single event. This is exact, of course, for IID random variables, because then N effect is simply the number of jumps. For the Levy walk, what you need to do is this probability is simply given by this thing. This is the tail of the density of each individual jump. This is kind of what you expect to have. And then this S, N effective is simply the measurement time minus x over v. This is valid only for the two-state velocity model. And what does this mean? It just means that to make a long jump, uh, uh, you need to start it in the past history. 
Now here you have x and here you have x, and if you take the derivative of this, you'll get two terms, and that will correspond to the infinite density that I just showed you. Uh, and that's, this implies that maybe one, one big jump event uh, can give you this result. So the, if you see here, this is x to the minus alpha, this is x, so I'll have two terms which will correspond to the result I just showed you before when I rescale things. Okay, so now this was an introduction to this, uh, if these laws of these large fluctuations, and now in the time remaining, I, I want to discuss a, a physical system. This is the, my work with Erez, uh, which we published uh, only this year. Um, and it's based on uh, observations of uh, anomalous diffusion of uh, rubidium atoms. Uh, I assume you are not experts on uh, laser cooling, but eventually it will boil down to some simple Langevin equation that I will analyze. Uh, but let me just inform you a little bit on this uh, field. This is, of course, a huge field uh, uh, in atomic and uh, in quantum optics. But uh, one motivation was uh, uh, just to, uh, to understand what are the experiments. Uh, you have here a set of rubidium atoms, and then you have an optical lattice. So two laser beams come from here and here. And the, the, the experimental group from Weizmann uh, keeps them uh, these atoms uh, in a trap, then they release the trap and they diffuse in one dimension, they spread out. This is just the observation, and here you see the profiles of observations, and they did this measurement and they got Levy distributions describing the center from reasons that I will slightly um, explain now. Um, this, uh, it, this is related to uh, the work of Cohen Tanuji, who got Nobel Prize on this, uh, the so called uh, a Sisyphus cooling mechanism, and here I take from uh, one of his works uh, 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 the, the effective um, friction that the laser fields act upon this system. And it's a very, very strange friction force. On, on the one hand, it's the best friction man made. The, this is how they cool atoms. So this is a friction force versus momentum of the atoms. Uh, and as you expect, if you look at small momentum, this is linear. This is like Stokes law. The faster you go, the friction is stronger. That's, you know, you collide more than you get. But now the source of the friction, so to say, is the lasers that you interact. And then he plots this uh, interesting curve that the friction goes up and then, oops, it goes down. So it's very unintuitive that the faster you are, the friction can go down. And the reason is because this is man-made friction. The lasers are not working well in some sense for very high, so he calls this free motion up here. And it goes like one over P. This is very important. And, and this means that in these systems, the friction is maybe the best friction, the strongest friction ever you can make because they cool atoms like this. Here it's very strong, but if for some fluctuation reason the particle will go up here, it will be nearly ballistic. This is just the phenomenology of this. And already uh, uh, Zoller understood that this system will produce you levy walks and levy fry to 21 years ago. So uh, uh, the, very briefly, the idea is you have a, a, don't worry if you don't understand because Sudan is going to give you a Langevin equation. But the, the, you have a, a, a system, it has an electro, a ground state and an excited state. You have two states, you have splitting due to the field. And the idea here of this Sisyphus cooling is somehow by very, very clever uh, Nobel Prize worthy uh, physics, you take the atom and it will go up the hill, it will be excited up and it will go down. That will be a, a wonderful cooling device because you go up, up and down, up and down. And this is done by the fact that the polarization along this field is changing in such a way that these transitions are more favorable. That's the quantum aspect. Now, even without understanding the details, you understand what will happen to a very fast pattern going, uh, uh, going here. It will not be able to go up and down exactly on the top of the hill. That's why for very fast particles, this mechanism doesn't work well because you cannot... Uh, get these things and you emit photons all over the place. That's the why it fails. So this is called Sisyphus cooling. And if you look at the moment, now this was the friction very briefly, but if you look at, uh, uh, so this is the force that, that I showed you from, uh, from Cohen Tanuji's review. It goes linearly in P and for large P, one over P. 
In addition to that, you also have some fluctuations, and here the fluctuations are given by the recoil energy, the atom jumps after it emits a photon. So the, this D is given by the recoil energy and the depth of the optical lattice. Uh, this is the distribution in moment, this is the Fokker Planck in momentum space. So you have a friction force which is nonlinear, and then you have a diffusion mechanism which is increasing with uh, ER, and this is called the semi classical description of these atoms. The idea of this friction is the following let's say you have a friction, and then you have some gamma times delta P. This is how much you lose energy. Then let us assume that you fall from the top of the hill to the down. So this is the kinetic energy before you fall down. This is after you fall down. This is U0. This is the size of the, the lattice. Then delta P, you linearize this. Delta P is U0 over P. And all the effects I have here is because U0 over delta P, so it's very easy to understand why it goes like 1 over P. So this is a friction that goes like down when P is big like this, as I already explained, and there are parameters, and this is actually exact. So you can easily understand why the friction goes down. It's simply conservation of energy. So without a, a further ado, what, what we are interested in the, uh, is in this Langevin equation, where you have dp over dt, then you have this nonlinear friction force, which goes down like 1 over p for large p. Then you have this white noise with the diffusion, and this is because of the emission of photons. And you have dx over dt over p. Then, OK, this is what I'm going to solve, and I want to find the probability of finding the particle at x. Now, what is this at all related to levy walks from the start? OK, so let us look at this in momentum space. And then I leak the momentum space as a function of time. And then what I do is the following. I start with some momentum, and then I have this zero crossing of momentum, and then you have another zero crossing, and another zero crossing, etc. This is simply the trajectory of the Brown, of this uh, uh, Langevin motion in momentum space. Now, I define the dots on the time axis where you cross zero. And then I have this uh, path that starts at zero, or very actually very close to zero, and goes back to zero, and then I look at the area underneath this. This area underneath this is called chi 1. Then I have the area underneath this is chi 2, chi 3, and then you have these times. These will correspond to jumps in a random walk, and these will correspond to waiting times. Now, in actuality, because the path is continuous, you have infinite number of them, so we regularize this. So if you, you add an epsilon, and eventually you show that it's not important. I'm not going to go into the details. Now, these, these guys, are because, what, because the dynamics is Markovian, then the distribution of these guys is like a first passage time, how long it will take you. Uh, and, uh, and then we also need to calculate these areas, these random areas underneath these curves. But if you have these two ingredients, you can more or less understand that I have the jump size distribution and I have the waiting time distribution in a random walk scenario. This is easier said than done, but the general idea is that the position now, you have these uh, high eyes, these are these areas, and then you have the last guy. These guys would be called excursion, and the last guy is called meander for reasons I'll explain later. And then one question is, is this guy important for the rare event? And the, yeah, the, the answer is also the last guy is very important. Now, if you calculate the distribution of these zero crossings, the, the time between zero crossing it goes like this three over two, this is like usual diffusion. And because you look at very large momentum, it goes like a power. That is the, the force at very large P is very weak. And then it goes like a power law and this can be calculated and also the distribution of these areas independently can be calculated. And then I can start uh, analyzing this, but the problem here is that these highs and these tau's are correlated to one another. This is given by this graph, this is the jump size versus time. And this is very simple to understand. If you have a long time between returning to the zero, then the area is going to be bigger, and then the jump is going to be bigger. But it doesn't go linearly like in the previous model. It goes like t to the 3 over 2. And this is diffusive scaling, because you can think if you have some big jump, then what, the friction is like zero, like it's one over p, so let's forget about it. And then you have, in momentum space, you have diffusion, and then the jump size goes like three over two. So this is the scaling, and this scaling is going to enter into the infinite covariant density eventually. Now, the question is, how do you calculate uh, the, the distributions of the jump size? So what we do is 
the, you have a joint distribution of the jump size and the waiting time. So this is the first passage time of the zero crossings. And then you have p high given tau. And I, this guy will scale like t to the three after as I show. But how do you calculate this pro probability density of the jump size given some return time? This is based on something that is called a theory of uh, constrained brown in motions or constrained uh, a random pass. And I learned this subject from uh, some articles of Majumdar. So let us first consider, uh, this is a simpler problem, but an, an area underneath a Brownian motion. So it means that now I'm forgetting about the friction completely now. Uh, you have a zero crossing, in, this would be velocity in my thing, but uh, you have something that goes up and then it goes down. And I'm interested in this area underneath this. This will give you, and this is, this is a random path, so the area is also random, of course. So for Brownian motion, this is a solved problem, and we solved it when you add to this the friction force, more or less. But let's see how you do it for a Brownian motion. So if it's a Brownian motion, I, I want to look at the area underneath this guy, and this is a constrained motion that started uh, at zero or at epsilon and, and came back to epsilon. Uh, then I uh, have this path integral formalism that is the weight of the Brownian path. I have to change this for my case, adding the friction, the one over P, but that's technical. And then you have this constraint that the particle, this theta function that the particle did not cross the origin. So you have a constraint in this path integral and then I'm looking at the area, then you have the, 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 uh, the this is my observable, integral from zero to tx, t minus a. If I take the Laplace transform of this, I get this uh, Feynman integral, a uh, winner Feynman integral. And because of my observable here comes into a like kind of potential, this is like in the feynman katz formalism. And it's linear because my functional is linear. And this means that you have here a potential V of x in the quantum language. If I go to a quantum mechanics, I'll have a linear potential. Uh, so it will be reflected on the boundary and the linear potential. And I need to solve this uh, in Laplace space, then invert it. Uh, this is called the airy distribution for Brown in motion. Uh, so the bottom line, it's a quantum mechanical problem in a trigon potential because of the functional. And this is valid only for Brown in motion. When you add the, uh, the friction force, it becomes a three dimensional Schrodinger equation with some repel repulsion from the origin, which we solve. Here I just showed you a cartoon. And the, the solution, the distribution of chi in our problem given tau is given by this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, um, expression. It, um, and, and this is, um, okay, this is not so useful, but uh, it's given in this uh, PRX. Uh, but it looks something like this. This is a absolute value, so this is the distribution of the, ta of the area underneath the velocity curves given towns for different d's. And when d go to infinity, it means that we can forget about the friction, and that is the airy distribution describing Brownian curves. So th this is the known result, and these are slightly modified because of the friction changes thing. Uh, but the, the bottom line is we have this distribution of these areas. Um, given this information, we can now uh, crank all the machinery, and we have all the information on the jump sizes and the waiting times, and we can get the density of the particles, and it has two scalings. One describing the center part is this Levy scaling, because this is when I choose properly the, the parameters, that is, I work in shallow lattices, which means that Uf is uh, U0, the depth of the potential over Er is not too big. If I go to very deep lattices, then I'll get Gaussian diffusion. So I choose, I choose the uh, parameter of the depth of the optical lattice in such a way that, uh, for example, the waiting time to come back is, has the second moment infinite. I can also work in a phase where you have Gaussian, and these Gaussian and Levy phases were actually observed in the experiment. So this is for the, 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 the shallow lattices, so I get this uh, Levy behavior. This is the usual Levy scaling. But then I can rescale things differently, 
similar to what I did before for the levy, simple levy walk model. But now instead of x over t that you add in the levy walk, now you have x over t to 3 over 2. And you see this data collapse. So the data collapses in the tail. So this is, this, this, this is old in the sense that um, people know about this levy scaling in the center. And this guy is the new thing that you have this uh, cutoff. And the cutoff is scaling like diffusively in essence, like 3 over 2. And I, we can calculate this PDF. So if you just want to look at the distribution of this guy, so we follow the same lines as I described before. We calculate all the moments exactly, but the problem is that these moments are given by these horrible distributions. So we cannot really calculate them, but we can write them as integrals. And then we have this moment generating function, and after we inverse transform it, excuse me, this is going to be the final result, we can get an exact expression for this infinite density for this uh, system. And this uh, infinite density has the following properties. First of all, uh, here it diverges uh, as a function of this variable x over t to the three or halves, and it diverges in such a way that this pole is non-integrable. And this pole, this, this divergence means that the area underneath this curve is infinite. That's an infinite density. This divergence is related, th th this divergence that you see here is actually the matching to the tail of the levy that you see in the center. So this is as usual. Now, at, at small scales here, oh, okay, th th this is the exact expression. And what you see here is that this infinite density, this function here that you see here, it's related by some complex integral to the uh, area uh, the distribution of the area under the excursion, and here m is the meander. So the meander is the last jump. So the meander, you add many zero crossings, and then you add one guy that didn't cross because you look at t. This guy is the meander, and all the rest are the excursions. I showed you how you calculate briefly the excursion when you come back to the origin, but you have to also do the calculation when you start somewhere and you don't come back to the origin. That's the last jump event. It, the formula for the uh, distribution of the meander is as horrible as this guy, but we can write it as an integral, and we calculated these guys, these two guys, Erez calculated this one, and then we have all this theory. This, if you will integrate this, the moments, will give you exact moments of this process beyond the critical moment. And it shows you the following. For small, if you take a, a small z, you can show that here the excursions are important. But if you go far to the tail, the meander is the important, that is the last jump is the important one. And this gives you everything between. It's not a universal function in the sense that it will depend on these uh, distributions, but so it's very different than the levy in the center, which is universal, but still we can characterize completely these large fluctuations. So I would like to summarize briefly the, 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 the works of Volpiani and many others. They later show that you have dual scaling of moments. This, this bi-scaling is very common, in my opinion. Uh, because you have two types of scalings, you, I believe you have two types of distribution functions. One of them is describing these Gaussian or these Levy things, and the other one this infinite density, so it's complementary to the central limit theorem in some sense. Uh, the, the, there are different types of observables that is integrable and non-integrable with respect to this infinite density, and you have to distinguish between them depending what you, moment you want to calculate uh, or observable in general. Uh, these uh, systems uh, describe growing number of systems, also in ergodic theory. Um, and here I'd like to thank my, uh, my uh, co-authors, uh, especially Sergei Denisov on the first walk, and Adi Rebishtok and Peter Henge. This is on the stochastic motions, uh, the Levy walk, and this walk with Erez and David Kessler uh, on the optical lattice. And now we have other walks which show similar behavior with uh, Vezani, with uh, Raffaella and Alessandro on Quen systems and the Lawrence gas, which will hopefully soon be published. So I'd like to thank you.
So uh, the the lunge, the Langevin equation you had for the momentum. So it looks like a particle in a logarithmic potential, right? I mean, right. Uh, in which case, I guess there's no uh, stationary state. So is that kind of crucial? I mean, like for the velocity. For the velocity, right? No, no. Th there is a stationary state. Depends on the parameters. Depends on what is d. But uh, the log potential. Okay, the, the f of p is uh, minus p, 1 plus p squared, so the potential is uh, so this goes like a power law. Depending on the power law. Uh, here you have a half. So uh, th this distribution was measured actually uh, so, so of course, if d is less than, um, uh, if if this guy is less than one, then it, it by itself has no, it's not normalizable. Here, there's normalization constant. But when it's not normalized. So, so when it's not normalized, what you get? I, I did not discuss this case for the position distribution. But w w when it's not normalized, then you have, don't have a velocity. You don't have a steady state of the velocity. Then what you get is uh, something we call the Obukov or Richardson phase. And you have only one scaling. You don't have levy and you don't have this infinite density. You have a solution. X go is like T3 over half. So actually what is happening in my case, which is the case where this exists, you have a levy and then you have this a book of uh, this scaling in the, in, in the tail. But then eventually this tail becomes more important in the center and it takes over. And then the full density is described by this scaling. But I did not discuss this because I, I, I discussed a case where the steady state of the velocity e exists. And, but actually what I'm discussing here is the case where the second moment of the momentum I is growing in time. Uh, if you go, if the second moment of the momentum is finite, but you change, that is the deep lattice, then you'll get a Gaussian at the center. But all this ICD still exists. The, uh, this ICD is valid also for Ga uh, processes that are in, it's not only for Levy processes in the center, the center doesn't have to be Levy. Also Gaussian processes will have this tail. So I may have misunderstood you, but initially you had this kind of multiplication of two independent random variables and some of that. And for that Const constraint that the total measurement time is the sum of the taus. I see, I see. And the constraint is important. Constraint is important. Okay. And then you said that the density can be approximated by something which is infinite in area. Is that right? The, the, the far tail, uh, yes, but yeah. But you can also compute the true density, right? You can. I can make a uniform uh, solution. We, we have this uniform solution because what, what I'm saying is like this you have. There's no uniform solution, but in the first part of the model, let's say this is the density. Here you have a scale uh, t to the one over alpha, and here scale, for example, like t. This is not uniform convergence. I know this, and I know this, and they match. So I can make a uniform approximation, which will be valid everywhere. We have that in our paper, but the. There's not one scaling in, in this problem, and there are two of them. And then if you want for finite time, you can match them. No other questions? Uh, in your uh, infinite density, uh, you can play around with alpha. Can you let alpha go to one or two in order to recover something interesting from... Uh, when alpha goes to, uh, for example, two, this corresponds to the Lorentz gas that I was discussing. And then you have all kinds of uh, logarithmic corrections. And you have a huge problem of convergence in such a way that the problem becomes much more interesting, we can discuss later, because uh, the central limit theorem uh, uh, result, for example, in the Lorentz gas, um, you have a central limit theorem, which is Gaussian, but with a square root of t log t. This is known by Blair. But this is found for, a, a, you need the number of collisions to be like astronomical to converge. That's a critical, because it's a critical point between Gauss and Levy. It's totally different and much more slow convergence. That's why it's easier to work with alpha, not close to two and not close to one, but it's very interesting in this Lorentz gas system.